Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Raw Men. Today I am honored to be with Wendy Davis. She was a former Texas State Senator and a gubernatorial candidate and uh, we were very impressed with uh, your heroic performance in the State Senate. As a matter of fact, you may not know this, but of course you don't. Uh, I mentioned you in a speech uh, in South Carolina a week or two ago nice. and just mentioning your name got an applause. Oh, that's so, so nice. Thank <laughs> you. A lot of people very impressed with you. I first became aware of you in 2011 when there was a like when they were trying to cut the, the budget and there was 10,000 teachers that showed up. My wife is of course mm -hmm. she's a teacher so we were there with the picket signs and all that. Yeah. We want to know from your perspective what was going on inside. So in 2011 as you know if you were there we were debating a proposed cut to public education. It was a 5.4 billion dollar cut and honestly, it wasn't necessary. Uh, we did have avenues that we could have utilized in order to fully fund our schools. And it really came down to the Democrats and the Republicans arguing about whether we should do that or not. Um, I, as is the custom in the Texas Senate, I gave the Lieutenant Governor a heads up that I intended to filibuster that bill. It actually had gone back and forth and back and forth throughout the regular session. So we were on the last day of the regular session and it was coming back through the Senate for final passage and it gave an opportunity to filibuster it. He did the smart thing, knowing that I was going to filibuster that bill. He moved all the other pieces of legislation forward in front of it so that they wouldn't die behind it. Um, and so it didn't get called up until, I don't know, it was like 10.30, 10.45 or so. So certainly was not nearly as long as my filibuster in 2013. But I felt like it was so important to try to kill that bill and see if there was a way. I knew we'd be called back to a special session to address it, but I was really hoping that we'd find a way to do that. And I also wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to get into those summer months so that the teachers and the administrators who otherwise were in their classrooms doing their jobs would have an opportunity to come to the Capitol and speak out against these cuts to public ed. And that did indeed happen, as you said, and you were among them. We had thousands of people who showed up uh, who were parents, teachers, administrators, all of whom were adamantly opposed to those cuts. A lot of the offices actually closed their doors to people coming in. They really didn't want to take the heat from their constituents who were upset about those cuts. And unfortunately, even though some really good proposals were floated through that special session and to not have those cuts go through, Republicans pushed them through anyway. And that immediately threw us into the court system. Um, that went on for years, actually. It wasn't until last year that the Supreme Court, the completely Republican-dominated Supreme Court, of Texas actually ruled that though they felt we were selling our school system short, they did not believe that it rose to the level of being unconstitutional and therefore, though they kind of wagged a finger at the legislature and pretty much said you ought to do something about this, they didn't do what they could have done in terms of ruling it unconstitutional. Doesn't the Texas, Texas Constitution specify that they have to fund public education? It does, and I don't remember the exact wording, but it basically says that the state is obligated to provide a free and effective and efficient system of public education. And there were legal arguments made under each of those principles in a prior suit against the state many years ago the state had been found to unconstitutionally be abrogating its responsibility to fund schools. But unfortunately, as I said, in this very politically charged Supreme Court, particularly with a Supreme Court justice who's had his eye on an opportunity for a higher appointment from mm -hmm. Governor Abbott and perhaps even from President Trump, unfortunately, we got a ruling that really sold our school kids short and our school districts are still suffering from that today. Are they going to be able to appeal? Unfortunately not. It was an appeal of 
a Texas constitutional principle to the highest court, obviously, in the state, and there is no appeal into the federal system for that. The last time that you and I met was at, a, was at another rally for public education where there was, yeah, I thought it was novel that there was all these people who were declaring themselves as Republicans and preparing themselves to be able to, you know, to abandon party loyalty to vote for the candidates of the other party if they wanted to save education. And one of the things that is a mystery to me is it does seem that the Republican Party wants very much everywhere, not just in Texas, but in, you know, across the nation, they, they have a thing against education. What is their objection? Did, did, were there tax cuts? Was that what the cuts to education was? Actually, in that particular year, we had a, a, um, a challenge in our budget that was not motivated necessarily by tax cuts. But we had opportunities to fill that hole, knowing that our revenues were on the rise, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that that was not put into. I remember into at the time, gas was like four or five dollars a gallon because of the rent. It was much higher then, yeah. yes. And and then what followed afterward was that the legislature, in a surplus, when we came back in 2013 and 2015, the legislature actually cut taxes mostly to those folks at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, none of us felt it at the homeowner level, mm -hmm. but those tax cuts put a actually a ceiling on now what the state revenue is and therefore it is forcing a lower than, um, than what we ought to be putting in participation in our public schools. And here's the really interesting thing that comes from that. You may have noticed at the end of this special session, Governor Abbott and Dan Patrick were kind of flexing their muscles mm -hmm. and criticizing Speaker Strauss. Mm -hmm. And they were doing that by saying that he didn't take advantage of an opportunity to actually provide local property tax relief to residents across the state. Mm -hmm. Well, that is absolutely not true. What's happened is that over time, the state once had a, a really big chunk of what it was paying for public education. And at the local level, we were also raising monies to be able to pay for that. Over time, the state piece of that started shrinking mm -hmm. and the local piece had to rise mm -hmm. to accommodate that. And it's that rise at the local level that is really creating higher property taxes for people but let's all keep in mind that that happened only because the state said, we're not going to do our fair share anymore. And now they're pointing fingers at local tax jurisdictions for the fact that they're having to make up Dan the difference. Dan Patrick is calling out mayors that the yes. mayors are the problem. Um, we went to testify about something else and the Galveston ISD was, uh, was uh, testifying about a different bill. And they were saying that they're a property rich district but a lot, of, uh, a lot of their revenue gets recaptured and, and goes back to the state. So uh, uh, they, they were trying to say, can we get some of that back? But then, then the person was like, why don't you raise taxes? And he was like, it's a hard sell to our taxpayers to say, we're going to raise a million dollars. And then send it to another the, school district. Yeah, exactly. They're only maybe getting how much on a dollar? Maybe 20%? I, I'm not what, sure. It, it's more numbers? than that, but uh, there are, for example, I think Austin ISD is the ISD that's having to give the most yeah. back at the state level. And it's this long, complicated history of the way we fund our mm -hmm. schools in Texas. Mm -hmm. It's that funding scheme, as well as the amount of money going into schools from the state, mm -hmm. Both of those two things are broken. And it was both of those things that we were really hoping the state Supreme Court would say, you've got to fix. And unfortunately, they didn't. And, you know, I, I, I always hesitate to say things like this because it sounds a bit like sour grapes. But mm -hmm. if I were in the governor's seat, mm -hmm. I would not await a Supreme Court decision to tell me to take responsibility for what I think is the most important role that state plays. It is 
creating an educated workforce, mm -hmm. which helps individuals who rely on us to do that. It creates opportunity for people across the state, mm -hmm. but it also provides for a stronger economy. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting in a situation right now, we dropped from number three in terms of the strength of our economy in the US to number 21. Yes. And I promise you, and there is data to demonstrate this, mm -hmm. It is fully reflected in the fact that we are not training the kind of workforce that can compete with people in other states. Yeah, and I mean, also, uh, when with those education cuts, uh, a fifth of the teachers lost their jobs. And th those are our, our living wage workers that are buying cars, mortgages. Exactly. And if you have a bunch of like low wage, uneducated jobs, uh, you're you're not going to be a, a strong economy exactly. or raise, raise enough revenue for your schools, and what, something like that. Of it, course, and then it starts this downward normal. spiral. Yes. Exactly. There, there's so many things that uh, where, where the Republican dominant uh, legislature is is creating a positive feedback loop with negative results. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, so, so they, they want to seem to they seem to want to create a division between the haves and the have-nots. You know, where they didn't want to have sex education and then they, they didn't want to have access to uh, contraception or any means of birth control and then they went, when they when they had uh, you know teen pregnancies or whatever then they, they cut off all the benefit programs so they can just make it worse and worse and worse and and with regard to the education thing this is Texas we have we have a space center we have we have technical industries the best you know? medicals, uh uh, medical research, medical facilities. Of all the southern states, <laughs> we should be literally a shining star. You know, I mean, very, that's, very true. Yeah, so it, it's it's very frustrating for us to see the way that things have been going. You know, and and just to let you know, I mean, my wife and I canvassed for you in your on your gubernatorial Thank run, you. and uh, we were there in your in your collection when the votes didn't come in because of you know record voter turnout. Well, the thing that we were no, seeing so no often. Record. Uh, yeah, record low, low turnout, record low voter turnout. We, and one of the things that we've been really against with a lot of our activism is hearing people say the whining complainers, you know, saying "Don't vote; it's a broken system." You know, yes. protest by abstaining, as if, <laughs> as if <laughs> that is a vote. That's what people need to understand: that that attitude always negatively impacts the progressive candidate. Because when voter turnout is low, mm -hmm. the people who are affected by that are the progressive candidates who could have otherwise been elected. And saying, I'm going to hold my vote home is essentially giving a vote to the conservative candidates across this country. You know, we're looking at the consequences of that right now at the presidential yeah. <laughs> level. We're looking at the consequences of that at the state level. We are a state that looks almost exactly in our demographics like California. Yes. We ought to be electing progressive candidates like mm -hmm. California is doing. And the reason that we're not has to do with a complex set of factors, but it all has to do with voting. Some of it, a very purposeful effort to suppress vote. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've now had rulings that our voter ID law was intentionally discriminatory, yeah. rulings that our redistricting maps were intentionally discriminatory. And I've watched over the course of the last couple of decades as Republicans have seen the demographic growth here and understood that if they can't keep our voters home, then they're going to lose their grip. So when I hear that our voters are actually participating in staying home, it's so upsetting to me because I know that we could be doing things so differently here. He, uh, he, I think he was trying to get at with like, uh, maybe not Speaker Strauss, but with uh, Governor Abbott. Do, what, do, it almost seems like they have something against education. Is it more just that they, they don't, they want to keep taxes low? Or no. they, is there something additional why they keep, Defunding it. You know, I, I've, I've, I feel like I have developed somewhat of a, might be called a cynical view. Mm -hmm. Maybe you would call it a realistic view. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was first elected to the state senate, I was sitting on the public education committee and I asked this very question. Mm -hmm. And someone said, 
Well, it's simple. They're trying to undereducate the community because an undereducated community is one that will continue to allow them to stay in power. Mm -hmm. I just didn't believe that. Mm -hmm. But as I spent six years in the Senate and then following that mm -hmm. and watching the continued efforts to suppress funding and support for our public schools, I've begun to believe there's some reality there that by holding people back, they can continue to sell the idea to a community that doesn't really understand the holes in, in what they're presenting, mm -hmm. um, that they are bringing forward the policies and the principles that are good for people. Are they trying to break the public school system in Texas, in your opinion, by, well, by starving it? Look at what happened in this last legislative session. The simple answer to that is I believe they are. Um, in this last legislative session, and again, you know, a, a kudo to Speaker Strauss because he and a group of both rural Republicans and progressive state reps mm -hmm. held back a voucher bill that proposed to bleed money out of our public schools, mm -hmm. give people a voucher, and allow them to spend that in a private school setting. A private school setting, by the way, that would have no standards attached to it as our public schools currently do. No, none of those heavy testing requirements and no so needs. much of the administration that goes with it. No, no accommodations needs. for special needs or so requirements there, for special needs. Just for those who, who aren't aware of this, that there are laws that the public school system has to adhere to to cater to uh, children with disabilities are sometimes referred to as children with differences. The charter schools and the private schools have no obligation to honor those laws, and they also can't be, uh, they're, they're not subject to the regular uh, restrictions or governance, and they're prone to corruption, and of course the private schools are usually exclusively religious, and I've been to a couple where they teach the Bible as the only source of truth in our world, advocating that the whole of reality may as well be dismissed as an illusion yeah. beyond that. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking about that separation between church and state and those areas where it is dangerously um, being ignored, these vouchers, um, principles or policies are a place that is fertile ground for that because it's taking taxpayer money and allowing someone to use that in a religious school. I have no problem with people making a choice to send their child to Catholic school or, or wherever, but I do have a problem with my tax dollars going to put someone into a proselytizing setting mm -hmm. and mixing that religious and tax money in a way that our founding fathers worked very hard to make sure would not be allowed. Even with the, some of the charter schools, there's been some encroachment with trying to teach creationism in Texas. Like I wasn't system. aware of that. Yeah, and that's that's a problem, I think, in maybe not some of the Catholic or Episcopalian schools, but but in uh, maybe some of the Protestant schools where they're teaching the Bible as a scientific, uh, uh, ac accurately account of how everything... Her and I have testified before the Texas State Board of Education a number of times, not just in defense of science, which is my specialty, but, but also in defense of uh, social studies, wherein uh, there was a number of textbooks that they were considering at one point that all treat Moses as if he was a historic character who was actually born in 1250 BC or what have you. And uh, one of the textbooks, for example, described the, uh, the, that the people who populated Africa were a Hamitic race, implying that they were the sons of Ham, right, being the sons of Noah, and and so there had to be there was a number of anthropologists and people like myself who were saying that no, this is this there's no truth to this, there is no anthropological value to this message, mm -hmm. but of course it seems to be that what the truth is, what the facts are, these are not important, and what's important is that you control what the students believe, you know, and this is why. Uh, we, we noticed that uh, any reference to other ethnicities were removed from our social studies textbooks. And if there was a reference to hip-hop music, for example, we saw that changed to country-western. 
you know, so that it, it turned out, there was a whitewash, so that everything turned out to promote white culture, white Christian culture, and it was like, as if there was nobody else. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think, at one time, it was on the Texas Republican Party platform that, that uh, they didn't want schools to challenge the parents' fixed beliefs, uh, meaning, like, it, uh, if they were they believed in creationism, then then they shouldn't teach otherwise. Right. Yeah. And the Republican Party, while the Republican Party platform in Texas no longer says that they're against critical thinking, as it as it used to in 2012, it does still imply that do you, that they want to teach uh, scientific theories as if they're questionable, and not just origins theories, but also anthropogenic climate change, mm -hmm. because this is a this is an oil state, mm -hmm. and we cannot threaten the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and it's like the opposite there, like we went to go talk, uh, testify about a bill where they were wanting the students to be able to talk about creationism. They want the students to challenge the science, but they don't want you, the school, to challenge the parents' uh, beliefs. Yeah. So. And I think that's maybe part of the reason why it's being underfunded, so that parents can uh, take vouchers and take take their kids to a religious school where their, their fixed beliefs aren't challenged. And, and moving on to the next chapter, um, you became nationally famous for a second filibuster in 2013 that was, that was it was the most dramatic moment I, I think we've ever seen on, on, on the little closed circuit cameras. Mm -hmm. and, you know, this, was, this was so amazing. For all of you who don't know, she did a filibuster that caught attention uh, nationwide so that everybody's watching the little government feed, right? And so mm -hmm. you push this filibuster all, almost all the way out and then there's this near riot at the end. And then I remember where it was, what was it, Dewhurst? Uh, who was this? Dewhurst was there at the yeah. time. And he, and he tried to change the date because she, 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 was, she was effective. It pushed the vote back to beyond midnight. So the, the filibuster had succeeded ultimately. And then he changed the date so that he could make it look like the, the vote had taken place before midnight. And it took three hours to explain to this guy that there were 180,000 witnesses watching on, on these cameras and that he couldn't possibly get away with that. And yet, does this man ever face charges? I mean, does anybody, what, what happens you know, here? No, I don't really know what the ultimate investigation of that revealed. Um, who knows, really, who was responsible for changing that timestamp. Mm -hmm. But we do know, and this is a testament to what happens on social media and the power that we have, even if we're not in an elected body, mm -hmm. Someone on social media had taken, I don't even know how to do this, they had gone into the system, taken a snapshot of the original timestamp, and the original timestamp showed that the vote was completed at 12.03 a.m., which meant that that bill did not survive. We killed it successfully. Within minutes, though, the timestamp was changed to say, I think 11.59, maybe 11.58. Mm -hmm. Um, and to this day, I don't think it's ever been revealed exactly how and why that happened. But our ammunition was that person, that astute person who screenshotted mm -hmm. the photo of the 1203 timestamp. And there was no arguing against that. Mm -hmm. um, though, of course, Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst did make attempts to try to figure out how to accomplish a different outcome. Ultimately, he, he realized that he had to accept the fact that the vote did not come in. I want time. you to talk a little bit more about that because this was, seriously, this was some of the most riveting TV I'd, we'd ever seen. I mean, it was like some election night. So like the, the time when Obama was going up against Romney, remember how we were, we're, we're biting our nails throughout that whole election night? And the then same thing the, watching the, you. at the final 15 minutes, everybody was cheering so loud. The gallery, I mean, yeah. Van de Pute, right? She sparked it. Exactly. <laughs> so, oh, what was the line? What, was, what did she say? Because so, they, they tried to shut you down some way, so they were yes. going to do the vote anyway. After, I mean, and okay, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. How do you prepare for something that you know is going to run for 12 hours like this? Well, it was, it was just under 13 hours, and I knew it would be that long. The bill was ripe to come to the Senate floor interestingly at 11 11 a.m um 
every day at 11 11 when i see that happen i make a wish a little superstition <laughs> that i have uh, but 11 11 a.m was when it was coming to the senate floor so we knew we had just under 13 hours um, to filibuster the bill and the requirement in Texas is different than it is at the federal level. A filibuster in Texas is truly a test of endurance. You may not have a sip of water, you may not lean on your desk. Of course, you can't have anything to eat, not even a hard candy, not even a stick of gum. Um, and you cannot leave the floor to go to the bathroom. And I saw, I saw somebody tried to give you your brace and, and and they, I think they penalized you for it. Yes, I, I got a strike for putting a back brace on because mm -hmm. Senator Rodney Ellis helped me to secure the brace mm -hmm. about, I don't know, halfway, three quarters of the way through mm -hmm. the filibuster when my back was really hurting. Mm -hmm. um, and he was charged with aiding a senator in a filibuster. That's mm -hmm. another one of the rules. We cannot help each other out. In the U.S. Mm -hmm. Senate, they can take turns mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, and, and give a break to the person who's filibustering. But in Texas, you cannot. Mm -hmm. um, so to prepare, I tried not to eat too much because I didn't want the consequences of that. <laughs> um, and not to drink too much either. I actually did have a doctor come over that morning and insert a catheter. So I would not have the need to relieve myself through the day. And amazingly, um, I did not get hungry. I did not get thirsty. Were you running for, on adrenaline? I, you know, really, especially when they started calling those procedural strikes, and mm -hmm. I knew that they were doing everything they could to shut the filibuster down against the rules of the Texas mm -hmm. Senate. Then I got so angry about it that it really kept me going. Adrenaline. It really did. <laughs> yeah, but so I, I'll tell you this though. What really, really mattered was that I wasn't alone, mm -hmm. that thousands of people made a pilgrimage to the Capitol yeah. that day, filled the gallery, filled every level of the rotunda, up and down every hallway, outside on the Capitol lawn. This was a group effort. And later on, it became known as the People's Filibuster. Mm -hmm. And to your point, in that final 15 minutes, when through a lot of procedural maneuverings they called the filibuster to an end lieutenant governor dewhurst did leticia vanderpute out of frustration because the democratic senate microphones had been shut off as we were trying to gain the attention of the chair in this procedural debate and finally she asked what was not just a pertinent question in that moment but it had a much broader meaning as well, and it wasn't lost on any of us. Mm -hmm. She said, Mr. President, at what point is a woman's voice or raised hand to be recognized over those of her male colleagues in the room? Mm -hmm. And with that, the gallery, who'd been so respectful mm -hmm. in observing the decorum of the Senate, mm -hmm. but watching senators themselves breaking the rules, mm -hmm finally had had enough and they stood up and began screaming with all their might mm -hmm. that sparked a fire you know in the folks who were in the hallways and on the rotunda and out on the capitol lawn and it was their voices literally that drowned out the ability to take that vote in time from the midnight so deadline. they helped run out the clock they ran the clock out it so was the just, people who did that just to remind everybody the the capitol was utterly full of outside supporters. I mean, literally thousands of people gathered in the building. So we were talking about literally thousands of people screaming at the top of their lungs so that no, literally no one could hear anything. <laughs> it was chaos in there. And as I said, it was riveting, you know, for us to be watching like, like the, the 180,000 other people were, and we thought that was a heroic effort. But the one thing we haven't mentioned here was why was it so important? What was the bill? The bill was an anti-abortion bill. Um, because abortion is legal still in this country, those who oppose it have come up with a myriad of ways to try to close off women's access to it. They have created these targeted regulations that are specific to abortion providers, not to any other medical providers. They're called trap laws, targeted regulation of abortion providers. And these came together in one bill. There were four different prongs of this bill. 
each one of them aimed at closing off access and closing clinics. And it was clear that from the outset, that was the goal. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst actually tweeted out a photo, he retweeted something that Planned Parenthood had sent out saying, after this bill passes into law, Texas will go from 41 or 42 abortion clinics to five or six. And they showed with a graph what that was going to look like. He tweeted that out and admitted that indeed that was the goal, though of course then later on at the U.S. Supreme Court they attempted to make the argument that the real goal was women's health and safety, which yeah. of course we all knew so, was a sham. So after this, I mean she was successful with this, with this filibuster, but of course our beloved Governor Rick Perry uh, forced another special session just to push it through again. That's right, and it went through, okay. but we never gave up. Um, and again, because of a lot of people who kept fighting and organizations like the Center for Reproductive Rights and NARAL and Planned Parenthood, we took this case all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court and it became a historic decision with Justice Kennedy swinging our way in a 5-3 vote because at this point Justice Scalia had passed away. Uh, and we succeeded in getting the law overturned and thankfully also the Supreme Court making some very strong statements for closing the abilities of other states to try to do the same thing. And I remember when Perry was, was uh, making this declaration about this, he called it an honor to women. That, that's the way they're selling this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, and this was on the same day, I, I think ironically, that he also fought, fought, fought signed his 500th execution order and that also happened to be a woman. That's interesting, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Like the irony of what uh, Leticia Van Peet said, um, when are women allowed to speak here? Because yeah. a whole bunch of men are deciding what women can do with their bodies and right. not listening to women. That's right. You know, it's fascinating to me because I hear so many conservatives, Ted Cruz, prime example, use the word liberty as though they're fighting for principles of liberty. And when I think about the differences between progressives and conservatives, mm -hmm. it's exactly the opposite. My mindset as a progressive is that everyone should have the liberty to live their life as they choose, mm -hmm. to worship or not worship, to, uh, you know, choose to marry or not marry, to be a parent or not a parent. Yeah, be a parent or not a parent. All of the things that are within our rights as individuals. And when you think about the conservative agenda, which is really um, two words that don't go together at all, when you think about their agenda, it's not conservative in any way. It is aggressively trying to foreclose the rights of other people. Progressives just don't adhere to that idea or those ideals at all. I'm currently running for Texas State Senate myself. Oh, I did not know that. And Congratulations. My, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my first uh, political campaign speech uh, was a week or two ago uh, in, in South Carolina, of all places, because I knew it would get national attention at the speech. But I mentioned that a lot of people think that because I'm on the political left, and that means that I like big government. And I say, well, actually, I want less government than people on the right yeah. who say they want less government, right. but who actually want the, the state to legislate everything going on in our bodies or in our bedrooms. That's right. So you're, you're, I'm, you're I'm just said. siding with you on the, that it's obviously not a liberty issue. It's <laughs> quite the reverse. Mm -hmm. So let's, um, we talked about how people didn't turn out for the vote, and how that affected us not just in Texas, but nationally. And it, I think it was finally a wake-up call, because yeah. in, in my district, for example, in the last few elections, there has been no Democratic candidate, nobody running. The, the Republican yeah. would run unopposed. Mm -hmm. So you go to the ballot box, there's the Republican right. and the nobody else. Right. So I mean, what, what are you going to do? But this time around, I was the first person in, I think, 10 or 15 years to, to run in this district as a Democrat, but there were four other guys that jumped in too. 
And then most of them have since jumped out. But the thing is that at one point there were five Democratic candidates in a district that hasn't had any, you know, in years past. Mm -hmm. And every uh, every Democratic or every uh, progressive group, independent or whatever, uh, said that after this last presidential election that they've seen a huge influx of, of, of more volunteers and more interest and more activists than they've ever seen, period, ever. And it seems to me that we will never again hear the people saying, there's a broken system to vote, because it, it's like everybody woke up and said, oh, well, if you don't vote, this is what happens. You know? Right. Because the, the, the thing that was so hard to explain to people is if your vote doesn't count, why are they gerrymandering everything? Right. Why are they working so hard to dilute? And, yeah, and people would say that there's no yeah. such thing as voter suppression, but we have all of these examples where it's been confirmed, and, and everybody yes, knows certainly. that gerrymandering is a thing, and that is voter suppression. It so was, it's, in, yes. in his district, uh, there's a slice of East Dallas, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it is, is rural, like a big piece of it to mm -hmm. yeah. Dallas, and, and you carved uh, Dallas up. I know that they may be changing the districting for the con for Congress. Right. Will it affect the the legislature the tech at the Texas it will, uh, also there was a ruling just last week on the state house map that it was also intentionally discriminatory mm -hmm. right now the court has ordered the redrawing of two congressional districts and it looks like there is going to be the ordered redrawing of six seven maybe even eight or nine house districts in texas mm -hmm. under the same idea that these districts were drawn to purposefully dilute vote based on race mm -hmm. and that is not constitutional so we we will see what the outcome of that is so but. a point of speculation if you will because we, we saw how people's vote would have counted if they'd actually bothered to vote yeah. right so and we've seen the devastating results of the, the the Republican, dom Republican dominant state government that we have now. How do you imagine things would have been different had people turned out to vote in the last election and you've gotten the government seat? Gosh, I mean, so many ways. Um, <laughs> one of the, the biggest, most important pieces of my platform centered around full day pre-K for every child in this state. And I really believe it's one of the most important things that we can do to turn around the outcomes that we're seeing at the educational level here. And also, of course, what we see with the educated workforce or lack thereof that we may, may have here. Um, I, of course, would 100% have vetoed the campus carry bill that is law now. We've lost some great professors to other states over that, and I'm sure there are a lot of parents who, when given the choice uh, between a Texas state school and an out-of-state school, are, are making that choice to go well, out of state. The funny thing there is when you go into the Capitol building, you know they're allowed to bring weapons in there, because they themselves don't want to get shot. <laughs> but, but okay, let's all carry our weapons in the, in the university. You know? Well, you, you can conceal carry a weapon in the Texas Capitol if you, you if you have a concealed carry really? permit. Yes, wow. you have to you know show your permit as you go through security, but you absolutely are entitled that. to do that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, you know, what's happened with the bathroom bill, which is just absurd, mm -hmm. that would have been a quick veto, and therefore, it's it's dead before it ever even starts, knowing that by the time it gets to the governor's desk, it's going to be vetoed. That's Working to fix school funding would have been a huge priority for me. And one of the things that we've seen um, just in the last two legislative cycles is that we've had even greater and greater assaults against women's reproductive freedoms. Yes. We've seen greater and greater assaults to defund women's access to health care. Mm -hmm. We now have the highest maternal mortality rate in the not just in the country, but in the entire developed world. Yes. Here we are, rich in resources, the great state of Texas, and we have the highest maternal mortality rate in the country. These are very serious issues, and the leader that we choose 
has a tremendous impact on the direction that we go. And look at what we're focusing on when you're talking about bathroom bills and how many hundred abortion bills. And we're going through a hurricane right now. And everybody's known for years that hurricanes hit Houston. And Houston is low lying. And it floods even with thunderstorms. And we're not focusing on infrastructure. Fixing those problems, that's but, right. And people are dying because of this. That's right. And, and, it, and it's, it's also bad for business. That, it, that a storm can shut a city down. Yeah. So I'm, Indeed. I'm hoping that people in Texas have learned a lesson from that last governor's election. You know, when we went the wrong way. You know, and, and, uh, and of course the nationwide. I mean, now, now that we have all Republican dominated everything in every level of government, the majority of state governments and all, and where we're seeing the economy drop, where we're seeing everything being more oppressive, more third world, if you will, that I'm hoping that by the next election that people are going to snap back and they're going to realize their vote does count and that they need to take some responsibility because now, look, look at the mess we're in now, how do we fix this? Do you think that both, they always say this, both parties are the same? The Democratic <laughs> Party and the, and the Republican Party, and I'm not going to vote. Yeah. It's just a, a di different party, but same. You know, just going through this 2016 election, it was so painful to me as a person who believes in the power of our vote. Mm -hmm. um, I campaigned for Hillary, but I was hugely respectful and a fan of Bernie's agenda as well. And there was no question that regardless of the person who came through that primary, that person was going to be my candidate for president and I was going to work very hard to get them elected. I was so disappointed to see people who supported Bernie, and of course this is not true of all the Bernie supporters, but many people who supported him were so disgruntled at the outcome of that primary and I understand there were reasons to feel disgruntled in terms of what was happening at the DNC and so on and so forth. But then to say, which I heard people say as I campaigned around the country for Hillary, uh, there's no difference yes. between Trump. the candidates that we're left with and therefore we're going to stay home. And it just breaks my heart <laughs> because there, first of all, is no perfect candidate. There will never be any perfect person elected to office, no matter where we are. And I understand that people may not have felt in 100% agreement with everything that Hillary has stood for through many years. Even if. But, <laughs> um, as I watched just this most recent example of what happened in Charlottesville, and my heart was breaking over the fact that we have someone in the president's office who is the least presidential person imaginable, who takes our yes. country to a place of hatred and, and discord rather than healing and lifts us all up to, to find the best in ourselves and the best in each other. And, it just breaks my heart because to say that there is no difference between the two people who wound up mm -hmm. as our uh, Republican and Democratic nominees is... There seems to be a very stark ideological difference. And, very much so. And I was saying uh, that about Hillary that even, if, even on the negative comments that people would make about Hillary, uh, as Sanders put it, you know, on her best, on her worst day, she's mm -hmm. better than Trump on his best day. And she had at least stated something she got criticized for uh, was she said that she had a public persona and a private persona. She had a private opinions, but she didn't hold to her private opinions when she knows that she's if she's a representative of the people, right? Mm -hmm. Then she has to follow what the people want. Right. And this is something I've been arguing for a long time. Uh, we shouldn't be electing people who are strong in their faith and firm in their convictions because that if you're hiring judges or or, or senators or what have or you know uh, sovereign leaders if they're firm in their opinions they've already judged your case before they are even heard the evidence yeah. you want somebody that will change their mind that will say okay well maybe i'm wrong yeah you know given that or even if i don't personally believe this this is obviously what 
the people I represent, this is the way they want to go, and so that's what I'm going to do. So, you know, kudos to her on both sides, and obviously nobody can say that about Trump. Mm -hmm. you know, Who do you so, like yeah. for 2020? Gosh, I don't know yet. It'll be interesting to see who comes forward. Um, I would love to see a Texan on the ballot um, from the progressive side. Let me, let me qualify that. Won't be me. I'm not trying to say anything like that. Um, but, you know, I, I think we'll have some fabulously capable people step forward and we'll listen to what they all have to say and decide what we think is best. After the governor's race, are you done with running for public office? I hope not. Um, I I miss being in public office. I I believed so strongly in the things that I was fighting for, and I felt like we had too few of voices that came from places of poverty mm -hmm. and who understood the struggles of everyday working people in this country to fight for them mm -hmm. against the oppression that comes in so many different directions. You know, I, I, I think we need more voices like that. Yes. And it's a, it's a voice I worked very hard to always be true to and to bring to the table. And I'd love to serve again. I don't know if that will happen for me. I don't know what that path might look like. What are you doing now? So now um, I've spent the last just over a year working to try to empower and lift up the voices of young women. Mm -hmm. When you look at kind of who's turning out, who's voting, it's mostly the older white people, basically, yes. and it's mostly the older white men. Yes. Um, and I believe so strongly in trying to lift up the voices of other perspectives. And when you look at that turnout number, unfortunately millennial women and Generation Z women, the generation that's coming after them, are ones that really need to be encouraged to understand how powerful they truly can be if they participate. Now, my passion, of course, lies very centrally in the area of gender equality. And so those are the issues that we work together with our young audience on. We work on reproductive rights and economic opportunity, on safety for women from sexual assault and domestic violence, and also on leadership, you know, developing that next level of, of women leaders. We uh, have a website, it's Deeds Not Words, um, that's borrowed from the suffragette movement. They were tired of hearing talk on getting the right to vote, they wanted to see action. And that's what I want to encourage our young people to find in themselves, not just to talk with each other about these issues on social media and otherwise, but to move their passion into some actionable change. And so we give them ideas and outlets on how they can use their voices more proactively, and then we do advocacy training too. We, in this last legislative session, we trained almost 500 young people uh, about the workings of the legislative process and how to get involved on issues that they cared about. We worked very hard on 10 different bills. One of them was a sex trafficking um, education curriculum bill, and the others were all around preventing and appropriately responding to campus sexual assault and sexual assault writ large. And I'm so proud of our advocates because they went to the Capitol, they testified for bills, they called their representatives and their senators and wrote them letters and emails, and they made a difference. And because of their work, we, I think, played a very important role in helping to pass seven different bills that were signed into law. And we're going to keep doing that um, in Texas, and we'd ultimately like to be in some other states as well. Just continuing to show young people the path into the system and to demystify it for them and help them see how very powerful it can be inside is, of it. Is that the name of your organization? Deeds Not Words. Yes, okay. that's the name. Which falls nicely in line with the motto of this podcast, where I want to talk to people who are actually doing something to make the world a better place. So you, you're perfectly in that category, I'm delighted. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting choked up. <laughs> and I'm delighted to finally have this meeting with Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much.
Was there, is there anything you'd like to throw out? One last pitch. Or, uh, I can probably provide links to your organization for people yeah, to please, support you. Yeah, please to, do that. It would be oh, great. There's the, one question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about the separation of church and state? As I said earlier, when we were talking about education, um, I I believe that we should adhere to that constitutional principle. It, it's one of the bases of the founding of this country and has so much to do, of course, with why we became an independent country. And that line is blurring more and more all the time under quote-unquote conservative mm -hmm. leadership that is really showing great disrespect to our founding fathers by doing that. And I, I think that you're a Christian, right? I am a Christian. And yeah. I know uh, Texas, a lot of people look at Texas like Everybody's an evangelical here. Right. Or fundamentalist. <laughs> but the, uh, we've worked with, te with Texans with the Texas Freedom Network and that are Christians that, that are working for toward the separation of church and state. So like you're an example of that. But, like not everybody in Texas is close yeah. to yeah. not all Christians. And again, you know, it's <laughs> yes. liberty. It's choosing and respecting each of our own decisions with regard to whether we choose to worship or do not, um, whom we choose to worship or do not. Um, these are very personal decisions for each of us to make, and we shouldn't work to impose our values in that regard on others. And the separation of church and state actually pre uh, protects Christians, too. Indeed it does. Like, it sure does. Like, from the state infringing on their, religious, their which, religious worship. Which reminds me, when Rick Perry signed the Merry Christmas bill. He made a comment to the camera that I, 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 I suspect was directed at me. <laughs> when he's because I was the only person quoted in the newspaper as opposing this bill. Mm -hmm. And I said that you can't have freedom of religion unless you have freedom from religion. Because once the state adopts a religion, both then, ways. then everybody every other religion it becomes subordinate to that one and you have to pay homage to the state religion somehow. So makes everybody else a second best citizen the playing field is no longer a level, right? And that's what made America great in the first place, was that we had this American dream where people could flee religious persecution in other countries and come to a place where no religion had, had dominance over any other, and therefore everybody became down to the personal efforts about whether they were going to be successful. That's what made America great. And it's not just protecting non-believers from Christians running the government, even though they think but <laughs> uh, it's also protecting Christians from other Christian sects, like Protestants, right. if, if the Catholics were in charge of the government. Right. Uh, and that's where it started with Thomas Jefferson. Uh, there was a problem with uh, uh, one religious sect uh, dominating the government. All right. I think we're going to close it up there. Okay. I do want to add one little thing about Deeds Not Words, if I could. Um, we do a weekly newsletter, and I would encourage anyone who may be interested, just go to our website, deedsnotwords.com, and sign up for our weekly, weekly newsletter. We curate a lot of interesting content about what's happening with regard to women's rights and issues around the country, and we end each newsletter with weekly dues. And then on our Facebook and Twitter, every single day, we have daily deeds that we encourage people to get involved with. And of course, today is really centered around making sure that we help the hurricane victims in Houston. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Most people know State Senator Wendy Davis for her heroic 11-hour standoff last year in defense of women's clinics across Texas. But more people should be aware of her other filibuster in 2011. That was when Governor Rick Perry tried to cut the budget on public education by $10 billion. This put 100,000 teachers at risk. One out of four teachers would lose their jobs, and the remainder had to absorb the extra workload. An estimated 11,000 people assembled in protest outside the state capitol then, and two years later, another 1,000 people packed inside the capitol, cheering Wendy on again as a record 180,000 viewers watched on live stream. On both occasions, Senator Wendy Davis stood alone against a voting bloc determined to push their own agenda, regardless what it would do to education or the economy and despite public outcry. It's time we had a governor who listens to, cares about, and stands for the people of Texas.